Hi all, uh, welcome to the Jenkins online webinar. Uh, today is uh, August 6th and we have a presentation by Olivier about how Jenkins builds and delivers uh, Jenkins in the cloud. Um, uh, if you, it's a, your first time at the Jenkins online meetup, uh, basically it's an event organized by Jenkins contributors where we focus uh, on presenting different things uh, about what happens in the project and in the community. So it's new features, uh, uh, developer tools, uh, also ongoing development and preview of uh, uh, things we, uh, we, you may see soon as users. Uh, the main goal is to actually show something, uh, to talk, and we encourage you to participate in the discussion. So you, you can use Zoom Q&A. After the call, we will also have um, a chat. Uh, so we invite everyone uh, to stay. And yeah, the goal, again, anything about Jenkins. Um, we also run a, a series of meetups uh, about Jenkins and Kubernetes. And actually, today's meetup is also about Jenkins and Kubernetes, though it's a bit specific because it's our own uh, project's uh, key study. So the release infrastructure Olivier will be presenting today runs on Kubernetes, um, and there is a lot of uh, various things uh, to learn about. So we are prepared to such case study. In general, uh, we're interested to have any talk about uh, integrations between Jenkins and Kubernetes, like plugins, features, Helm charts, tools like uh, Operator, or integrations with other uh, CNCF uh, uh, ecosystem projects. And uh, if you want to present, uh, let us know, because uh, we're always uh, looking for speakers. Uh, regarding our current meetup schedule, so yeah, we have a meetup today. Uh, the next confirmed meetup is August 17th. It will be about GitHub apps authentication and checks API integration. We also plan to have um, uh, JSOC project demos in the end of August. We may uh, organize some additional meetups in the middle uh, because yeah, the, we usually announce meetups with one week advance and uh, uh, there might be more meetups in August. Um, so if you're interested to present, uh, just let us know. Uh, if you want to do so, there is a uh, um, a page which describes how to do the process. We have an online uh, open uh, CFP process, so you can just prepare good or gold docs, submit to the mailing list, and basically that's it. Uh, so, speaking of the today's uh, uh, meetup, again, uh, we encourage you to stay in the discussion and uh, ask questions. Uh, so, if you want to ask a question, please use Zoom Q&A. Uh, this is a button to name your control panel. Uh, you, if you ask the question, you either answer it asynchronously or ask the speaker uh, after the main part of the presentation. And again, you're welcome to stay uh, until the end, uh, and then we will have open discussion. So basically, uh, we will uh, stop the recording, and uh, uh, you, we can discuss any topics related to the presentation or to Jenkins uh, um, after that. If you want uh, to ask questions after the presentation, for example, if you uh, watch the video on YouTube, then uh, please use chat, use uh, info mailing list, uh, or use uh, the feedback form, which we will be sharing in the chat soon. Okay, uh, that's it from me. And yeah, again, thanks uh, to everyone uh, for participating in the meetup. And uh, I'll let uh, Olivier to do the main part of the presentation. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'll share my screen now. I guess I can. Yes. Um, <laughs> Zoom is doing some interesting thing here. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, it doesn't allow me to share a screen, uh, a window. It only allows me to share a screen. A desktop. What's happening here? Right. So you're going to share your screen, right? I can, I can share the full screen, but I cannot share one specific window. Oh, yeah, it's not supported in Zoom. Okay. Okay, then let's do it in a different way. Um, sorry for that. No, 
just reorganizing my window so I can just share mm -hmm. uh, desktop one. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. So if there is anything wrong with the slides, uh, feel free to tell me. So, um, so hi, 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 everybody. Uh, thanks for attending this session about how the way the Jenkins project is releasing um, Jenkins. I'm the Jenkins infrastructure officer for, for the Jenkins project, and I did give uh, the, the and I did this project basically. Um, so the presentation is split into six parts. The first part, I'm, I'm going to talk about what the Jenkins infrastructure project is. Um, then I'll, I'll, I'll clarify a few things, and then we'll go into the detail, I mean, um, more specifically about what the infrastructure looks like for the release environment, how we configure the release environment, what the process is, to trigger release, and then we'll conclude this presentation. So first, it's important for you if you're not necessarily familiar with what the Jenkins infrastructure project is. Um, basically, we are a sub-Jenkins project. So the Jenkins project, like any organization, rely on infrastructure and provide services like the main website, um, the ticketing system, and, and a lot of different things. And so in this case, um, we are also working on, on, the, on the release, obviously. So the people contributing, so it's an open infrastructure, you know, it's an open infra project. So uh, we really invite a lot of different contributors to participate. Um, as you can see in those slides, uh, people are sp spread on multiple time zones and multiple location, which means that it forces us to put in place some um, practices like having asynchronous communication and also if you rely on testing and stuff like that. Um, there is no really, really rules about what um, it's in the Jenkins Infra project, but what I would say is there is an organization on GitHub called Jenkins Infra where we can find a lot of different um, repository that describe multiple things like um, the main Jenkins that are your website, um, the puppet code that we use to manage our infrastructure, a specific a configuration for the Kubernetes clusters that we manage and, and so on. So if you are looking for something in particular, that's usually the best place to go. And otherwise, um, feel free to just ask on, on RC. You should find all the information on, um, on the Jenkins LA website. Um, before we continue, I would like just to clarify a few things. So, so those are not like um, real knowledge, but just to be sure that we talk about the same thing. And the first one is that during the presentation, I'll be using the term Jenkins master. I know that we are changing this and we'll use a different one. The only thing is we don't have validated the results about using a different name. So I've been thinking about, should we just use a different one, should should I use the one in the results, whatever. And I just prefer for today to just stick to the Jenkins master name so we all understand what it means. Um, another thing is during the presentation, I'm going to talk about different Jenkins instances and the Jenkins project manage a few of them for multiple reasons. So we have, if we go, um, if we go from, oops from the left. Um, we have trusted CI, so that Jenkins instance is running in a private network, only available to few maintainers, and we use it to build the main Jenkins website, the update centers, or any other job that we just want to be sure that only a group of people can access it. Since this machine is running on a, on a, on a virtual machine. Um, then we have CI. Uh, this instance is used by the security team for security work. Um, I will probably not mention too much about that one. We then have infra.ci, which is the one that, I've be, that I will talk during this presentation. Um, it's mainly used to manage the Kubernetes cluster and to run some um, tasks for the infrastructure on a Kubernetes cluster. We have uh, in the middle ci.jenkins.io, alias ci.g.io, which is the way we usually mention it in the main, the main list. This one is the major and the biggest um, instance that we have. We use it to test the core. We use it to test plugins, uh, library, whatever. Um, this is probably the one that you already saw if you 
contributed somehow to the Jenkins projects. And finally, the biggest, the, the one that I will talk mainly today is release the CI, the Jenkins that I own. So this is the Jenkins instance um, used for the releases. Um, while all the people, uh, while it's quite, I mean, as soon as you have, so this instance is running in a VPN. So if you have access to the VPN, you can see the job results, but only a few people can trigger a job there. Um, so both release.ci and infra.ci are running and configure on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, another thing that I would like to clarify here is about the release state. So before I go into the different components, I just want to say that you may have seen previously that we now um, manage all the release from the new environments. So the previous state was um, we needed Kozuke, so the founder of the project, to trigger a new release, um, which obviously puts strong dependencies on him and his machines and his house. Um, it was quite hard to contribute, so even if the script used for the release were public, we had no access to the machine, so we couldn't help him to debug and to release, or, I mean, to, to really understand what's up, what was happening in his machines. Um, and also it's why, I mean, at least a good thing is it was like um, security by obscurity because we had no access to the machine. Um, we assumed that it was, um, working correctly. And so basically we created a Jira ticket on the, our ticketing system, so infra-910. And the idea was to do all the work needed to move from a machine running in a basement with Jenkins to um, cloud services where the where Jenkins community had the control on the release environment and could trigger a new release if it was needed. Um, so that's basically all the work here. And it involved obviously not only um, configuring Jenkins, but providing the infrastructure, providing the service and the process to do the full release. Um, which bring benefits like everybody can audit because we try to be as open as possible. Um, everybody can contribute to all the parts, um, but we wanted to be sure that only few people could trigger release. Um, but obviously because we moved from a machine running in the basement to the clouds, it was also harder to secure. So this is a really big overview of the different components and I will now uh, go into the detail for each of them. Sorry. So now let's talk about the infrastructure. So now let, let's go a little bit about the infrastructure. So basically, as um, everybody in the everywhere in the, this presentation, you are going to find a few links. So each time I, I specify the Jenkins organization and the Git repository. So in this case, all the things related to the infrastructure is located on the Jenkins infra slash Azure repository. Basically, we use Terraform to describe resources running on Azure um, and, um, and ev everything was designed to use Kubernetes. So basically, oh, sorry. <coughs> so for the for the for our infrastructure, we need few resources. As I said, everything is defined using Terraform code. So you may see a uh, Kubernetes cluster uh, with Windows auto scaling nodes, Linux auto scaling nodes. We define network configuration. We have DNS. I mean, most of the things there is managed in Azure. Um, we also rely on Azure Key Vault to store the code signing certificate that we need in the in the process. We use um, we store it to so to store the secrets that we use to decrypt our secrets and so on. So um, there is no I mean the, it's not really rocket science there. It's mainly we need a resource. We describe it. Um, once we commit the code to the Git repository, it's tested on ci.jenkins.io, so we have linting tests, validate some text, and, um, and then what we used to do is once the PR was validated, we merged it on trusted.ci and it was deployed from, her, from there. Um, the reality is today is that for um, cost reason, we had to stop building um, the PR, um, the infrastructure for the PR, but 
Uh, basically, what we were doing each, each time we created a new PR, we were deploying everything from scratch. And so we could test that we were able to upgrade from a point A to a point B, or we were able to project everything from scratch. And obviously, it was costly. And then um, we also had to disable that job from Trusted CI because um, we lost faith in our codes, which is, I mean, I'm sad to say that, but that's the current state. Um, and basically, I learned a few things working on, on that part is first Terraform. Testing Terraform is quite difficult. Um, it asks you to constantly um, test your Terraform codes. Um, Terraform relies on third API that evolve. We deploy services that evolve on cloud vendors. So it, it means that we have to constantly test it to be sure that it still works. Um, Testing our Terraform code, the best way is to provision resources, but at the same time, it's quite expensive. And finally, um, automating Terraform uh, apply can be risky because if you have state in your resources, you don't want to take the risk to delete accidentally a resource. So you want to each time review what are um, changing. And so that's one of the things that I learned working on this. Some resources could, could be automated and others not. And finally, there are, there are tools that were created to solve these issues. So if I have to work on this, and otherwise, if I still have the time, um, there are a few interesting tools that you should look after, which is ConfTest, a TerraTest of TFSEC. Um, I only saw some demos there. I haven't had the time to really deep dive into those tools, but this is definitely something that we miss in order to re-enable um, um, the way we manage our infrastructure. Um, another thing is more specifically for the community cluster, the AK and the AKS that we are using. Something that I learned more like the hard way is you have a lot of features that need to be configured at creation time. And so we really have to be sure in advance what you are going to need. And um, otherwise you just end up by recreating the cluster again and again. Um, so at least a good thing is you test your Terraform codes, but on the other side, um, yeah, just not using the best way of time to test your infrastructure. Otherwise, again, as I said, uh, it's not really rocket science, um, but um, if you are interested to really go more deeper in the Terraform code here that we are using, everything is located on the Git repository. So just usually the loop to contribute or to understand how to participate in the Jenkins Infra project is first by discussing. So we use Jira, mailing list, RC. The first step is first to identify if there is a need. And if there is one, you're probably the best person to implement the change needed here. Um, once you did that implementation, you test that on ci.jenkins.io. If the tests are green and someone can review the PR, um, then we merge the PR, we deploy, we validate, and then we improve and the loop continue again and again and again. So um, the good thing is working on infrastructure, um, we usually have to work on that the first time and then you can just reuse the work that you did. Then once you have your infrastructure in place, you have to configure and deploy services running there. So either you rely on cloud services or you maintain yourself. In our case, we have both. Um, because we are using Kubernetes, we even rely on the current and Helm to deploy our application. And obviously we have Jenkins and a few other services. Um, so if you really um, need to participate to the release environment, one of the first thing that we had to deploy was a VPN because the Jenkins didn't have the VPN. And if we wanted to move from a machine running in a basement, we had to be sure that only a group of people uh, were able to, uh, to, to access our services, our trusted service, uh, our tr uh, trusted services, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, we also use LDAP to define group and manage access. We have a Jenkins instance called release.ci. We publish our, our artifacts to a Maven repository called repo.jenkins.org. And um, finally, all packages can be downloaded from package.jenkins.io. Um, those are yeah, public um, services, except that, no, all except that release at CI, but still. Um, and we have two main, uh, three main Git repository involved here. So we have the first one, which is about OpenVPN that lets you, that allows us to configure the, v, the OpenVPN Docker image. Um, but also to configure it and to to specify who can access the VPN access. So we both use um, LDAP authentication for the VPN and certificates. So someone need to trust you to, to sign your certificates. 
so you could connect uh, on the VPN. We have the Jenkins Infrastructure chart repository where we define all the stuff related to our communities cluster. Um, how we configure Jenkins, how we configure Nexus uh, for some, I mean, for local Maven repository cache, how we test, I mean, we have, yeah, we have a bunch of services running on the Kubernetes cluster, and we also use a Puppet to manage the VPN machine. Um, the main reason is because the VPN machine need to have, need to have access to different um, networks, private networks, and I wanted to be sure that we had network interface in different locations. So it was just easier to do it on a virtual machine. Um, if, because um, I think, at least in my case, I'm more interested to share about um, the communities and how we manage this, I will just highlight the different tools used to deploy and configure release that's either Jenkins.io. So um, we mainly use Helm as the package manager for communities. So Kubernetes is just a way, so if you're not familiar with that, it's just a way to describe um, resources. And so you just say, okay, you need those resources and Kubernetes will convert that to real resources. So you just provide them with files and Kubernetes will create the volume, um, the network interface, the, um, all the things that it needs for you to deploy your application. And a Helm package is just a way to describe all the resources for a specific application, like you have a Helm package for Jenkins. Um, then you have Helm file. Helm file is just a way, it's just a tool that allows you to deploy and manage your Helm application on your cluster. So you just run Helm file apply, and then it will ensure that um, the right configuration is used with the secrets and, and, and so on. We use SOAPS. SOAPS is a small tool to encrypt and decrypt the secrets. And talk, I'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. And then um, we use another tool that I wrote, which is update CLI to automatically define, uh, to automatically update files based on some strategies. So when you look at the deployment, so the Jenkins infrastructure charts, you have a lot of different directories there. So I will not go, I would not show you a specific configuration because I think that if you are interested by that specific session, it's just better for you to go on that Git repository and look and just learn the way we are doing this because we have a lot of codes. But just yeah, just give you some um, some uh, guidelines about what to find where. So the chart directory contains custom charts or custom charts. The Helm file directory contains Helm file um, configuration files. So basically, uh, we have one per application, and that's where we define we need that Helm application deploy in that namespace with that configuration using those secrets basically. Um, the cluster directory uh, contains the definition of our main cluster. Um, at the moment, we only have one. I mean, it really depends sometimes we have to, uh, we probably deploy more cluster, but it depends if we have the time to work on that. But for now, at least we have one. <coughs> we define configuration secrets. Um, we have a Jenkins file that work on Kubernetes. Uh, so we just define the different stages that we apply when we want to deploy our um, application. We have the pod templates. Um, also, I, I talk a little bit that I'll talk about that uh, in a few, few slides as well. But just to give you a big overview, the pod templates define the environment where you are going to run your Jenkins file. So if you need um, a container with Helm, um, that's a bit the place where you define that. Um, and finally, update CLI is the directory where you specify all the strategies that we want to apply to update files. Um, I'll talk that more specifically in uh, one slide. So if we go back to the secrets, we are using SOAPS. So SOAPS is a tool, a tool from Mozilla. It allows you to store your secrets in a Git repository, which makes it quite easy to audit. Um, you can easily roll back a version, so you can, you can um, configure secrets, roll back to the previous version, and so on. You don't have to maintain a third service. Um, you can have different keys per file. So um, I found it really useful in the case of the Jenkins project where different people have access to different services. And so um, I can easily delegate the permission, the management of let's say the release environment to a, a subset of people while other maintainer have access to the application. And finally, we can, there are multiple ways to decrypt and re-encrypt um, the secrets, the secrets um, there. So in the case of the release project, we have an Azure, we use Azure Key Vault to decrypt this, those files. And the Azure Key Vault is only accessible from a specific uh, private network. We use um, the GPG key for a contributor. So if you're granted access to, to that Git repository, um, 
we probably we basically we need a GPG key. Um, at least in the case of the secret, it has been working quite well. Um, we try to not put everything in Git repository, so we, um, on purpose, we decided to just put uh, the code signing certificate elsewhere, and the same for the private GPG key. So those are stored on Azure Key Vaults with limited access, but then you need um, you need the Git repository to access those. Um, so yeah, the idea here is just to not put everything in one location. Another tool that we are using, which is um, something that I'm using to um, apply strategies. Um, so in this case, what we have is we just define we just define a source. What's the rule to update a file? So in this case, we just say we want to use we want to specify the Docker digest. So each time the Docker so we fetch on the Docker registry for the image taking slash Jenkins column at slash gdk eleven, and we fetch the digests and then we check with the target. So the file located here. We check inside the key jenkins.master.image tag. And if the digest does not match the one that we retrieve, we just change the file, commit the change, uh, we commit the change, open a PR, and so someone can review the change and, and just we move forward. There are different ways. I mean, we are supporting different um, sources. Um, we can fetch version for Docker Digest, we can fetch version from GitHub releases. I mean, that's, um, yeah, it's just a small CLI. Um, so just uh, yeah, define different different condition. And so the second example in this case is um, when we want to update the weekly releases, we just fetch a version from the Maven repository. We fetch a version. We test that there is Docker image that exists with that specific version. And if it's the case, we just update the target. Um, so yeah, that's what we use to con con continuously either update the Helm chart uh, version, uh, the pod templates, uh, the version, the, the, the image used in the pod templates, or any other um, YAML configuration. So just, um, this is what the job looks like when we deploy and configure the Kubernetes cluster. So it's triggered every 30 minutes. And so we, we need the secrets. We just check if we can update the, um, the files. If we, if we can, we just update them. And so we do run, we do run some tests uh, on, on, on the files, and then we just run the ham file uh, apply. And so if it's needed, ham file will we ensure that the Kubernetes cluster yeah, has the, the latest version. And this is run every 30 minutes, and that's been working quite good for us. Um, something specific to our environment is the way we manage the Jenkins master. Um, in this case, it involves three things. So obviously, ham charts, uh, plugins, and the uh, GCAS configuration. For the ham charts, we may we made a custom Jenkins chart, but basically most of we we just have a strong requirement on the upstream one. So we just try to reuse as much as possible from the stable slash Jenkins ham chart, but we just uh, override default values for our environment. And we also add a specific Kubernetes resources in our case. We have a third ham chart called ham dash Jenkins dash release, um, but it's getting less and less important um, over the time because um, the way to configure Jenkins on Kubernetes evolve. And so this is something that, that we try to do as well. So now most of the configuration is done inside the GCASC. Uh, GCASC um, that, uh, so that's why that third M chart is becoming less important. So the two most important plugin in our configuration is obviously the Kubernetes plugin because it allows us to run our load on Kubernetes and the configuration as code which is a central piece of our infrastructure and really allow um, more contributor to really understand what we are doing, how we are doing it. And if someone identifies something that can be improved, it just, um, they just open a PR and, 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 and it will be applied um, next time um, our uh, job is running. So inside the GCASC, you can find the cloud, the cloud, the, the, the configuration for Kubernetes. In our case, we specifically override the default um, GNP pods um, because we have Linux and Windows containers, and we want to be sure that those are running on specific nodes. So we just uh, specify um, node affinity that need to be used for every container in our cluster. And, and that's it. We have the LDAP configuration 
the credentials for um, the Jenkins master, and then we define the job DSL. Uh, we judge the job using job DSL. So uh, we have on the release environments mainly the core and the remote team components. Um, I'll give you a demo um, at the end of the presentation if I have the time. Um, regarding the way we manage the Jenkins agent, um, something important to understand when you use Jenkins agent on Kubernetes um, is that the environment um, is defined using a pod template. So a pod template on Kubernetes, it's a resource where you just say, um, my pod templates contain those containers. You can have one or you can have several uh, uh, containers. Um, the way the Jenkins agents work, you always have the GNLP container, which establishes the connection between the agent and the master. And then you had as many containers as you need, um, depending on what you want to, to use in your Jenkins file. So you have different ways to specify that pod template. So either it's defined uh, inside the global Jenkins configuration, Personally, I prefer to not put any configuration there except it's the GDP um, containers, because if for some reason um, we have to configure the GDP connector in a specific way for the release environment, like for the node affinity, it's defined at the global configuration. Otherwise, everything is defined either in the shell libraries and in the case of the release projects, um, everything is defined close to the Jenkins file. And close to the Jenkins file, you can either inject snippets of your YAML um, pod templates, or you can reference a pod templates um, next to the Jenkins file, which is definitely the one that I prefer personally, because it allows you to run LinkedIn tests on your pod templates um, and also use um, any tools that manipulate YAML. Um, so that's why you always see in the Git repository that we are, that we are running on communities, we, you always see a Jenkins file and a pod templates that YAML or multiple pod templates, if it makes sense. And regarding containers, something important that you also have to keep in mind is most of the time, if you use uh, containers that you haven't built yourself, they will probably not using the, the root, uh, the user ID, the UID 1000. Um, it's usually better to use the same UID than the Jenkins agent. Um, it's also usually a good idea to override the default commands because we want to be sure that the container is not stopped, is not stopped after a few seconds. So let's say if you use a container for just the CLI inside, you will probably have to override the commands so that you can sleep for, let's say, um, 99 days or whatever um, you need there. And finally, I try, I mean, I really like, because um, this is something that's easily to manage on communities, I really like to use persistent volumes when it makes sense. So um, again, it's really depends on the situation. Um, but in the case of the release environment, we have a specific website that allows you to download the um, that allows you to download the file from a location. And that that website um, use the same volume, a user volume that is also mounted in the CI environments. So we just have to copy the move of file into the right directory and it's immediately available um, from um, to, to all the people that rely on that specific website. Um, and finally, one of the most important thing to keep in mind when you work with Jenkins agent is to use pod limits. Um, but limits allows you to have auto scaling cluster, but on the other side can be really frustrating um, because if the limit is too low, you are going to face really weird issues. And on the other side, if the limit is too high, um, your pod will never be scheduled on any nodes or it will just create and provision nodes again and again and again. Um, so um, yeah, and as soon as you start using pod limits, um, you know, it's just better because you're going to face interesting issues there. So on a global basis, if I can let communities manage a resource or, or instead of Jenkins, I just try to, to let communities manage it. <laughs> So what I wish I knew uh, before working on this, uh, so just keep in mind that persistent volume, um, if you let communities manage them for you, may not really be persistent because if the communities die or whatever, uh, just lose the volume there. So if you really need persistency, then it's better to manage communities out of uh, the volume outside communities, let's say using Terraform. Um, 
Another uh, really great tool that I'm a really big fan um, is Cert Manager because Cert Manager allows you to, to generate the SSL certificates. And when you work with a lot of private services that do not have public access, um, it's just a game changing because you don't have to connect in a service and just um, accept an unsigned so self-signed certificate. Another point important is regarding the Git, uh, storing your secrets in Git, uh, just be ready to rotate them. Um, I, mean, I'm not, I, mean, I mean, it happened, but um, just pushing a secret in an unencrypted way is just really the uh, best way to lose a lot of time and it can be quite easy to do. So, and I'm, I mean, I heard many stories about people who just accidentally pushed the secrets non-encrypted way. Not, not encrypted. So just be ready that if you put your secret in a Git repository, you are able to change the secret and um, rapidly um, because yeah, it happens. Um, personally, in my case, I remember one time I pushed all the secrets and then when I, I just reviewed the, the PR, I realized that my, my files were not encrypted. And so while it took me a few minutes to, to change the secret, to, to, to verify that, okay, it was not possible to use. Um, it took me days to verify that nobody were able to abuse of that. And also what I found interesting is that it just take a few minutes for third vendors to detect that I pushed uh, the secret publicly. So I received a lot of email from companies saying, um, you should use your tool. You shouldn't basically push um, GitHub token uh, publicly. So I try to put in place a few, few things to, to mitigate that. So first now, secrets are not pushed to public repositories. So there is a private repository where only few people have access to that. And also, um, I always try to double check um, that I don't have any secrets um, leaking somewhere, somewhere. But yeah, still, um, it happened. But um, um, I mean, in my case, the good thing is, yeah, Nobody was able to, to have use of that, but yeah, just lose days uh, on, on that. Um, Kubernetes auto-scaling feature is really powerful, but again, because um, for that you need pod limits, um, you are going to face really weird issues. And so um, sooner you start to work with pod limits and auto-scaling, better it is because um, I, I remember in my case, I first worked without the pod limits and then I enabled the pod limits and I just Last quite, um, I mean, I just lost, day, lost days just to understand why my job was running and not anymore, and what was that wrong issues about that file that was not able to be written and so on. So yeah, sometimes it's really weird. And finally, to, to debug um, pod, limits, pod limit issues, having some monitoring in place that allows you to really understand how you are using containers and what's happening inside your containers on the Jenkins master, but at the same time on the Jenkins agents and easily correlate those information together, make it really easy to realize that you have a pod limit issue there and it's not something else. And in my case, yeah, Prometheus Graph and Idoki was really easy to deploy. So yeah, good surprise um, during this process. Um, how to contribute to this part? Again, um, you have a few links um, across the slides. Um, you have the Jenkins Infra Puppet repository, you have the Jenkins Infra Charge repository for the Kubernetes code, you have OpenVPN, and um, yeah, you should, you should be able to, to find all the information by yourself if you are more interested about this specifically. And now let's quickly look at what, um, yeah, I don't have a lot of time anymore, but uh, I'll try to speed up, to speed up a little bit. Um, just look at the, the release process, what it looked like today. Um, in this case, we are involving a few more tools, Bash, Maven, Python, and Makefile. Um, before we continue, I would like to clarify that the Jenkins project has multiple release types. We have the weekly releases. So those are generated based on the master branch on the Jenkins core repository. It's done every week and it's triggered by a cron job. We have a test releases. This one is more carefully selected and we tend to freeze um, the code, but also the scripts um, used to, to generate the release. This one happened once a month-ish, but yeah, there is no strict rules there. And then we have the security weekly and the security test. The main difference compared to the weekly and the health test is in this case, it involves security work and most of the work is done in private until the, really the, 
the last moment where we publish everything. So um, obviously it, it increases the complexity of the release environment for that because we need promotion mechanism. So the release process is split into two different jobs. The first one is the Jenkins release. So the, the job is divided into categories, the Jenkins release, where we fetch the code and we published a result on the Maven repository. So basically we start here. So we have um, the release code is defined on the Jenkins refresh slash release. We define the Jenkins file that define the different stages, the pod templates, what the environment looks like to run the Jenkins file and a few scripts. Then we move, we fetch the code from Jenkins here slash Jenkins. We publish the artifacts to the Git repository and to Maven. And then we trigger a second job, which is Jenkins Infra slash release. Then we trigger to a Jenkins Infra slash release. And again, we have specific Jenkins file for the, um, for the packaging. We have specific pod templates for Linux and Windows packaging, a bunch of scripts, and then um, we fetch um, the packaging script from the Jenkins CI packaging, and then we publish the results on package.jenkins.io. Um, the scripting involved here um, are multiple, and it evolved over the time that I work on it. So obviously, I started working on the Jenkins file, um, then realized that I had a lot of complexity there, and it was not necessarily easy to test that. So. I started using make files. Um, make files is really, I mean, that's a tool that I really love because it helps you to abstract common complexity. So let's say instead of having really long command Docker build with a lot of parameters, you just run make build and it's easy to read and it's easy to understand that in your case, make build means that you're building a Docker image. But um, the same that happened with the Jenkins file, after a while you start to have quite a lot of complexity in the make file which become quite hard to read. And so that, that was the moment where we started at working on the bash scripts. So the, that bash script became the central piece of the release environment. And so I could use the same scripts from my Jenkins file, but also from my machine. So I could test exactly the same thing. And then the bash scripts um, had most of the complexity obviously, but it also became the place where I define all the environment variables and the default values. Um, the main reason is because it can be easy to override the value of an environment variable. So I prefer to define everything here and there is a convention um, to not define a um, variable elsewhere unless it's really needed. Um, then I started uh, looking for specific scripts. Uh, so I wrote Python script when I had to manipulate YAML, JSON, XML um, APIs. Um, but still, I prefer to keep the Python script as small as possible and always call them from the bash scripts. And obviously, we have the Maven release plugin um, I mean, for this, for this reason. So the release workflow looks like this. Um, we check out uh, the, uh, the Git repository that we want to, to, to build. We plan that, so we just visualize what we are going to do. So which Git repository we, we check out, where we will push the artifacts. We retrieve the code signing certificate from Azure Key Vault. We have the same for the GPG key from Azure Key Vault. Then we run Maven release prepare. We commit from um, the Jenkins file. So we don't use the Maven release prepare to commit um, because we want to be able to use different Git repository than those defined, than the one defined in the pub.xml for those who understand what the Maven release plugin does. Um, we stage the release and then we verify um, the, the GPG signature and the code signing certificates. Again, everything is available on public Git repositories. And for the packaging workflow, it's kind of the same. We fetch a GPG key, G code signing certificates. We download the Jenkins.war from the Maven repository um, that we find um, in the previous job. And then we build and publish packages for each distribution. If we need, we do promotion, um, and then we force a synchronization of the mirrors. Um, what I wish I knew before working um, on, on this part, um, first, Maven release plugin, plugin seems to be black magic to me in the past, and it's still black magic to me. Um, second thing is, um, try to always use the right tool. Um, in my case, um, 
I try to not overcomplicate um, something specific. So I like to use Bash, I like to use Python, I, I like to use um, Jenkins file in some, in some cases. And I always try to evaluate if I'm still doing the right thing. So that's why um, I put complexity in the Jenkins file, then move that complexity to the make file, then realize that it was better to maintain that in a bash script um, and, and so on. Um, try to always define an environment variable location strategy. So basically try to define your environment variable in one location. In my case, I decided that the source of truth would be the bash script. Otherwise it's easy to just override the value into multiple location and it can be quite hard to review um, how you're doing. So, and it's really important to decide where you put those environment variables because it will affect all the scripts used um, elsewhere. And finally, try to keep in mind what your environment looks like when you work um, on scripting, because it doesn't make sense to write a Python script if um, your environment will not have Python um, on the other side. Uh, it may make sense to add Python environment to your, um, to your site, but again, it really depends um, on the situation. What I propose to do here is to share um, a different thing in this case. Oops. I can share with you what the release environment looks like. So we have two directory, one for the components, one for the core. When we go into the core, I hope you can read up now. Uh, yep. So, yep, I'm connected. So I, I went into the core directory. So there we have um, two, two directories for stable and for the weekly, and otherwise we have the core packaging. So we have a generic um, job for the core packaging and the same for the release. So if we go to the weekly, basically that, that thing is just, um, so we, we can build from the master branch. Basically what it does, it just triggered um, the generic packaging job uh, by the generic release job and the generic package. And so if we go, let's say here, we'll see that we trigger on the branch on the, the number 28. And so from here, let's open the ocean because I prefer the visualization there. You can see that we do the different stages. Um, and so in the case of uh, a security release, the idea is kind of the same, except that, that this time um, bench. In the case of security or LTS release, because you create a branch where we freeze the parameters, so in this case for the LTS, we can just go there. Uh, I will just trigger this. Uh, we just trigger the job and then we are uh, shown um, a bunch of parameters. So in this case, we want to build a stable release. Uh, we can provide a few parameters and um, yeah, once we, we push the button, the release is sent. And regarding, yeah, I'll just go back to my presentation. Yes. Um, so just to conclude this presentation, um, it's only the beginning of, the, pro of the, the release. And now that the community has the control of the release process, it's our role to, to make sure that um, it's maintainable, that we can regularly update um, our environments. And we are still looking for people who can take the ownership of the different components. So um, we have to maintain the infrastructure and the Terraform codes used for the infrastructure. We have to be sure that the way we configure our services are reliable and people can contribute to that. And finally, we have to be sure that we control the, the, the process and how we do the release. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Again, um, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them in Zoom Q&A. Um, yeah. uh, one question we received is, uh, for scalability, is it possible to have Jenkins running on premise and also uh, run uh, build agents in the cloud? So it's not uh, directly related, but yeah. So what's the question? So if you, uh, if you run Jenkins on premise, yeah, and putting engines uh, to the cloud. And, and Mark, wait here. I do it all the time. 
So I run on premise and use cloud agents because I don't want to host mm -hmm. all the infrastructure on, on my local environment. So yeah, it works great. Uh, now, so, yeah, it's, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. actually it would be interesting to take a look, uh, at delivery pipelines, but, uh, from the code side. So if you could uh, briefly present how it looks like uh, uh, the release infrastructure pipelines and uh, ecosystem uh, from the GitHub point of view. I think it would be a great addition. So I'm not sure to understand what you mean by the delivery. So on the, um, how we published uh, on which delivery pipeline? Well, basically the same pipelines as you presented and uh, how we deliver them to the instance. Yeah. So just to be sure that I understand correctly. So for example, if you go to the Jenkins infra slash release, um, so if we go, for example, for the packaging job we have uh, here. Yeah, no screen sharing, by the way. Sorry, ah, no, sorry. Um, Loading the, the window. Can you see my screen? So, basically, for example, in the case of the packaging, we define in the Jenkins file that we want to use the Kubernetes cluster. So, obviously, the Kubernetes can be running wherever you want. It's just that by default, it's easier if your Jenkins is running on the, the same Kubernetes cluster because by default, it has access. But otherwise, you can provide the configuration that you want. And then you specify a pod template. In this case, YAML file with the pod template's definition. And then inside your um, Inside your Jenkins file, you can say, for example, from time to time, so by default here, we are on, on, um, on Linux, but for example, we have a job where we need to be running on Windows. And in this case, we just said, use the pod template definition provided on package-windows. And if we look at what that pod template looks like, um, there is another actor directory pod templates. And so, for example, if you look at um, package Linux, we just define um, which image we want to use, um, what are the limits, and, and, and so on. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So uh, since we don't have uh, more questions in the queue, I suggest uh, that we just stop the recording and uh, continue with the live discussion. Uh, and thanks again to Olivia for the presentation. We shared the uh, feedback link in the chat. And again, we will appreciate your feedback so that uh, we can uh, make our next uh, meetups better and provide more relevant information. Um, the next meetup uh, will likely happen in two weeks and see you there. Thanks all. And I'll stop the recording.